So whereabouts are you uh, joining me from? Where are you teaching at? Uh, USC, University of Southern California. I, nice. uh, I was fortunate enough to get the job uh, when Peter Erskine retired. So I can I started here in in August. Yeah, and it's great. It's really, you know, welcoming and staff so helpful. Everybody supportive. I had great students that um, that challenge me and that want to learn. And you know, so I'm in. I'm in it. This is. I'm in the thick of it. It's good. That's always that's always great. The difference between students who are like motivated and students who don't want to be there is huge. Night and day. It's like you can't even it's, you, to speak them both in the same sentence, and it completely changes. I mean, everything that you do and, and think about, like you know, when I mean, only thing that I can say is um, I was teaching at another school, and um, I had one student that was just not motivated, not wanting to be there. But I lost sleep over that because I'm trying. I'm I was trying to figure out how can I just get through. You know, I think in the end I was able to get through, but like teaching is hard that like I just don't write that student off. I kind of, you know, I go home and I'm trying to problem solve. I'm trying to figure out how can I get this person, you know, to this place. I mean, if they don't want to do it at all, then that's one thing. But, you know, um, just like not motivated or not seeing a path, you know, I'm just trying to clear that up for them. And I was able to get through. So, I mean, it's hard, man. Teaching is no joke. <laughs> and you've been doing it for a while, but like, you know, I think it's a little different in, in there's, there's some, some similarities and some, some things that are different. Like, you know, having private students, it seems like it's a little, it's a, it's a different ball game in general, right? Because you're not really, you know, the university or no one is holding you accountable for your type of teaching that you're doing. Um, so, you know, on the university level, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm quite sure they're talking to the students, other students are talking to other students. So it's more parts to, to kind of put together. But um, I really enjoy teaching. It's, it's where I need to be right now. So nice. And are you comfortable sharing what it was, at least in general terms that finally got through to the student who didn't want to be there? <laughs> um. No, I mean, you know, like we started, what, the way I approached it is it was just like, what what are you interested in, right? You know, and he was just like, I don't really know what I'm interested in. I know, you know, sometimes the drums, I'm not like movie. I'm like, okay, let's talk about, I love cooking. Let's talk about food. Let's talk about, you know, I love fishing. We talked about life and it was that kind of, I was like, you see the way, like he started explaining something about, um, he had a passion about, it. I don't know if it was, food or something like that and i was like see that is the that excitement that i see in your eyes i mean that's something that you like and that would be the same thing that's that's the way i want to see it with the drums and you say you like playing drums you're just not motivated it's just like i think you need to change your perspective being in the studio it, in the practice i think a lot of it came down to when they go in the practice room they don't know what they want or what to practice right we give them some things to practice but when they get bored that way, then I when they come back in for the lesson, I'm like, OK, let's change it up. OK, it was boring for you. And I listen to all my students lesson. I make all of my students record an hour and send it to me every day. So I'm quite busy. But mm -hmm. when he sent it, in, I was like, OK, so we're working on these double paradiddles, triple paradiddles and single paradiddles. What does that sound like to you? It's just like sounds like an exercise. So we put it in logic. Then we made grooves out of it. You know what I'm saying? We, you know, we and so that seemed to to get him motivated in that way. He felt like he was composing at the same time as working on on you know, routine stickings, that kind of things like that, you know. So I think it's just trying to how you present the information. A lot of my thing is the students really don't know, they don't see the path. They don't see what's down the line. They just they want they want to see it. If we could show them, you're gonna sound like this if you play this, you know, like really closely, then maybe they would practice. But like we've been preaching that for a long time, so it's just like we have to keep going down and meeting them at a, at a certain level or on the level that they are. And like, okay, man, you like I don't know, you like Glasper, you like this. Let's figure out how to turn Wilcox into a groove like that. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm just trying to meet them where they are. And 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 kind of in, inspire uh, excitement from that that standpoint, 
you know, this guy really just, he just wouldn't practice. He wouldn't come, he would come in lessons. I'm like, man, did you get a chance to work on it? Oh yeah, yeah I worked on it like 15 minutes. I'm like, so what are we going to do if you only work for 15 minutes? Like what's happening, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of what we do is, I mean, for lack of a better word, I don't know if they're going to hate me for saying this, but it's kind of therapy. Like you're really talking to someone and trying to really coach their life, right? It's like everything we do on the drum set, the type of person you are, the way that I teach on the drum set is the type of person I want you to be when you go in the world, whether you work at Starbucks, McDonald's, whether you're in this, because you're going to have to get along with people and you have to figure out how to problem solve. So, you know, I'm always putting it on that on that human level. Every lesson has a human element, a human element trans, uh, component to it. You know, it's never like, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I've ever been there, but I'm not the type of drummer that we're going to be just playing rudiments all day or playing Wilcox all day and, and not knowing what we're going to do with it, you know? So it sounds like you're the type of teacher who wants your, wants, wants their hour with you during the week to feel like something they look forward to and to feel, to feel sort of like a, a safe space. And I, I have a similar feeling. Like I never want my students to feel stress about the lesson. I don't, I don't want them to dread it <laughs> the way I sometimes did in music school. Um, but to the, to the, to some degree, at least they're all part of the, part of the value teachers provide is holding people accountable. Right. And knowing that there's a, there's a reason I'm practicing this exercise when I could just go to the bar with my friends or something. It's because I have to play this for Clarence this week. So do, do you think consciously at all about balancing providing accountability to your students with also not wanting them to feel nervous in the lesson or to, to be stressed out? Well, it's like what you said. Um, when I first started teaching here, and when I taught at the other school that I was at, um, I had that that kind of come to whatever it needs to be lesson, like where I wanted this room to be a safe space. I want us to be able to talk about any aspect. I'm never looking for perfection. I'm looking for you to to I want dedication and commitment and consistency. Like I had one student that came to me and it was just like, oh yeah, I'm dreading juries because you know I, I think I, I don't have it perfect. I I can't play it at a at a you know at a hundred percent volume. I mean at speed. I said, man, I, have I ever asked you for perfection? If you can play it at seventy percent, shit out of it at seventy percent, I'm happy. Or if it's 60 percent, because you're going to get something out of it as opposed to pushing yourself to play it at 100 percent and you you have playing the, the, the transcription. So I do a lot of talking about this space being sacred in this place, this space being um, safe. That's why I have all these these sayings on the wall. Like we have issues and, and I, invariably I will say it's right there and they'll look at it and, they, and then we have a conversation because. It depends on the day and the perspective that you are in, what that's going to mean to you. You know, it may mean something to you different, uh, something different next week. You know what I'm saying? So um, I do spend a lot of time that. But for me, I know students like to practice what, or I should say like to play. They call it practice five, six hours a day. I'm like, that's great. Keep that up. That That's your time. I'm asking you to just give me one solid focused hour on what we're working on. I want slow, deliberate practice. I want contour and everything that you're playing. If you give me that, then we're good. You can practice all that other stuff. To me, it's not practicing, it's playing. Because when you practice, it's about playing from stuff that you can't play. For me, I was just before this call, I was on the drums that trying to play something that I couldn't play. And that takes a long, it takes a while. It doesn't happen overnight. I have to, I teach them we, I, with my students. I talk about patience a lot. You have to be patient. A lot of us don't want to be patient because we turn on YouTube or we turn on Instagram and those guys are there. I'm like, no, okay. All right. They're there. Let's dissect this. What's going on? What is it? A lot of times, you know, the guys are just playing triplets, eight, no, 16th for the most part. Maybe nowadays we got a couple of quintuplets in there, but like, you know, we're not talking about like Garska. We're talking about like, you know, guys. And and I say we all have that ability. 
like how do, how would we what kind of plan should we be on to to get to that if that's what you want to do be able to play those kind of things in your in in, in your playing be able to call it at a at an instance you know and we work from that way so what i'm doing is trying to teach my kids how to start thinking right because a lot of people don't want to or a lot of students don't want to necessarily think because i don't know if if if, if it's a lot of thinking when you're looking at youtube you know it's just like okay i'm just going to do that right but like it's impressive but like what is that like do you really want to play that exact thing or do you want to take that and 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 have it be your own voice to try to find your own voice within that you know yeah and i'm also i mean like yeah it's I think there's more room for there's there needs to be more room for uh, well there is a lot of room but there needs to be more people with their own voice you know it's scary it's a scary place to be in because then people judge you not sounding like whoever it is that may be the hottest cat at the time you know yeah but I think at the end of the day it's about you go ahead Nate sorry yeah it's the other thing is there are only only so many hours in the day. And to get good at any one thing takes years of repetition. So if you're constantly jumping from one shiny object to the next, you're, you might be just going surface level with, with everything you hit. I, yes. I wanted to turn this to you and your, your oeuvre a little bit because I see you on Instagram these days and you're practicing an eclectic assortment of things. I'm, I'm, I'm noticing a lot of quintuplets and, and groups of five and, and in particular fitting like odd length phrases within even length phrases. So you'll do like a fill in 16th or 16th or 30 seconds, but you'll also play like five or seven note shapes over that. And I'm thinking back to some of my favorite recordings that I heard you on or that I've heard you on. And actually to prepare for this interview, I was, I was shedding along to strange liberation with Dave Douglas. But I think one, in my mind, one thing that was unique about your playing and, and you were like a huge influence as I was, as I was uh, learning the drums was that dichotomy between tradition and sort of, eclectic fearlessness jump off the cliff and i feel like you can hear it in strange liberation where there's so much tradition in what you're playing but also like so much experimental stuff uh going on and i wonder if you have any insight into like why you're wired that way or why like how you balance those things it could be it could be wiring but i remember being in the symphony when i was uh I was in high school. I was playing in Detroit, uh, the Detroit Symphony Civic Orchestra. And we were playing, I don't know, it could have been Trike 4 or something like that, the cymbals. And I was like, and I told the percussionist, I was like, man, be slick. What if they put this drum groove under that or like, you know, this is, and he was just like, blasphemy, you cannot do that. Clarence is just, you know, I was just like, wait, what? Why not? You know? And so I always been of the mindset of once you have the foundation, like, everything that you experience, you can bring, the foundation is never going to change. If you have a strong foundation, that, that foundation is never going to go away. So it's about bringing in all of those other experiences. So when you hear me playing five sevens, when you look at Saron, <laughs> Anthony, the portrait, portraits and rhythm, the classical book, it's fives and sevens all over that nines. And so I was trying to bring that into the, the modern jazz realm that I was, I was playing in. So um, you know, I heard when I was young, I heard that uh, Tony Williams was into Stravinsky, he was into a lot of modern uh, uh, classical, a lot of modern music, period. And so I was like, yes, why can't we bring that into what we're doing as long as we do it respectfully? I have a problem when people, when you can tell, like you're playing, like say if we're playing with Dave doing Strange Liberation, that kind of stuff, it's a, it, it's a certain thing that it fits under. But if I start bringing in some gospel chop kind of thing, it's going to, it's going to not, you know, it's not appropriate, but I think I can, I think we have to go to the practice room and try to figure out how to get that. We have to shape it. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm saying, being respectful to the the idiom or the, the, the music that you're playing. I think everybody's original idea 
there's room for everybody's original idea on the, you know, in jazz, especially with drums, you know? I mean, we shouldn't be limited to certain subdivisions, eighth notes, triplets, 16th notes, especially in 2023. My my thing is that I would love to be able to, and I'm trying to still figure it out, like how do, how do you play a, a, a swing solo and you're only playing five, sevens, and nines groupings, you know? And that can swing, but it takes some time to really to get to that, you know. So, you know, I think part of it is probably uh, wiring. But also when I was playing with Betty Carter, Betty Carter told me, she said, I don't want to hear that Philly Joe. I did the same thing that Greg did. I got up in the rehearsal and I was playing and then I started playing. She hated it. If you played Rimshot on four, I was being Cyrus was playing. She said, wait. I said, what? She said, I don't want to hear that's Philly Joe. I don't want to hear that. Who are you? And I was like, whoa, what? I don't know who I am because I've just been checking out Philly Joe. And she was on me for two and a half years to find myself, you know? And I would check and I would listen. And, you know, me and Blade would talk about things. And um, and he was like, he was able to take a trajectory where he didn't have somebody like Betty Carter. Betty was really shaping your our, our playing. Um, and I think probably, I mean, I never thought about it, but if I hadn't played with Betty Carter, I probably would have, I would be a different drummer. I don't know what kind of, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I'd be a different drummer. But um, yeah, I definitely feel like we have to bring something original to the table, but with, with respect, you know. Well, it's coming through to me from kind of an outside perspective. I, th I think because as players, one thing, as as we get older, it's, it's interesting to com compare notes for other people just because art is so much about our subjective experience of living within ourselves and how does this feel to us and emotionally how does it feel when we're going for, through this or that thing so we're kind of trying to reach out to other humans to 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 benchmark our feelings against theirs and so so one thing i'm hearing in your answer is like a combination of higher than average work ethic with also higher than average rebelliousness. And if I were choosing a combo to, to bet on, for, to, 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 to make like a very, a very interesting musician, it's, it's hard to do much better than that. But I also wonder if you have any reflections on the era in which you and Hutch and Blade and a few other people came up because looking back on it, it, it was kind of a renaissance, wasn't it? And it, it had the energy of a, a reinvention, but at the same time, it was kind of going back to jazz's roots and sort of rediscovering acoustic jazz after after it had been almost declared dead, hadn't it? And then, then all of a sudden, there's there's Winton and Branford, and then there's Josh Redman and Mel Dow and Kurt Rosenwinkel and Adam Rogers and and all these other people coming out of the woodwork. Like, what was it like? Like looking back, what what was it like to be a part of that? And to the degree you're able to say, like, what do you think? caused that that bloom of of extraordinary creativity in like late 90s early 2000s i don't know maybe not what but who right um mm. you have to give credit to to went to marsalis because of of his presence like that was the first time that i saw any a jazz musician playing he was playing with the detroit symphony orchestra and he had a you know suit he, they, they did an interview he spoke well and i was like man i was just taken by the way that he spoke a lot of people are and still is um so i was taking that and they were just they kept saying like you're jazz and classical and i kept saying i want to be jazz and classical because i really i only wanted to be a, a, a classical musician that's i wanted to be a tempest that's all i didn't drum set really wasn't uh, an, an option. I wasn't thinking about, oh, I'm going to be a drummer. It was like, I wanted to be in symphony um, orchestra and, and I wanted to be a timpanist. And so um, Winton definitely had a lot to to do with um, with, the, with with how jazz was, was played back then. Um, it was really exciting in that 
I felt like we were all working toward a, like a common goal. Like right now, everything is so fractured. Everybody's everybody's into that, that, that. Like, but like back then in the 90s, it was like you had classical. You still had like, you know, you had um, smooth jazz. But like the jazz was like really concentrated into this post-bop, you know, modern um, style. And it was really, I don't know, it was exciting to to be a part of that in trying to create that rhythm. I mean, cre create that, 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 that space. But when you think about like, it was new vocabulary for me because I, I hadn't, I didn't know Jeff Watts until I heard Jeff Watts. And I was just like, what was that? And Jeff was into Elvin, but like he, you know, he, it was modern vocabulary that he was using with the quintuplets with the flams. Same thing was Ralph Peterson. So all of those, those two guys definitely, influenced a lot of what I was hearing and, and wanted to play like. Um it felt like I don't know, I think it was probably um it was less distractions, <laughs> you know? I mean it was really uh everybody trying to just swing and everybody wanted to look the certain uh, look the part uh, also, you know, every people used to dress up, you know, and um and I I, I remember Sometimes the dressing up, I was talking to Alice Marcellus, the dressing up thing would get you in trouble because I remember being in the club with Alice Marcellus and this guy came in and he was completely clean, like suit just, and I was, I, I hit Alice, I was like, man, that guy, he's can probably really, really play. And Alice says, you should be careful. Not everybody can play, but they look like, and he got up on the drums and he couldn't play. <laughs> and Alice looked at me, he was like, see? I was like, oh, okay. You know, so... But like, I don't know, I think there was just a, I don't want to say there's no respect now, but like there was a respect that we had the way we presented ourselves and the way we, we played, you know? And I think, and, you know, and it was, it was okay. I don't know. I mean, what do you think about jazz now? Do you think people, I, I don't want to say respect, that's too harsh of a word, but do you think people, do you see people, do you think people see the value in it? I've been, I've been trying to figure that out. Like, because, yeah, I, I made a video about, about this last year, but I noticed from my perspective, it seemed like some of the vitality that I used to see in New York was gone or harder to find. And I wonder if that was just my bubble. And, and people have told me like, it's, it's migrated to New Blue. Um, that's, that's kind of the, the scene. Is that now. where it is now? Okay. And, I, I love that, that idiom as well. Like everything those guys are doing, um, Mike Mitchell, Jarris, JD Beck, like that's, that's sort of Nate Wood, Lewis Cole, that, that sort of new language. And I know that Smalls is still going strong. Like they really got a good thing going during the pandemic with the live streams. Like, and so you see, like, there are a lot of great young players coming up. I, I wonder, yeah, I, I wonder if we're just sort of like the, the jazz gallery scene or the 55 bar or, yeah, like, like those sorts of things. And, and th that's, that's an open question for me. It's, it's different now. And, like, what will become of it is, is really, really – Hard to say. I mean, I wouldn't have a living if it weren't for the internet, but I think it's also resulted in in a big fragmenting. I mean, doesn't it come down to, I mean, it's incredible drumming, but I keep asking myself, like, where does the jazz element fit in? Because when you mention those and amazing musicians, like, I don't know if I would say that's in the jazz category like jazz now it's you know like i want to be inclusive right you want to be inclusive it's like it's all of that stuff but like you know it's like very uh, this much of the tradition and then this much of the new stuff so you know i'm in a constant battle with myself of like i'm trying to tie it in together equally you know i think it should exist equally you know and i think people you know, of course, the latest, the, the newest thing or the newest job or newest well, way of playing and people just are attracted to that. Um, 
but you know, I'm I'm still I, I'm always going to be dragging the old with me. You know, I'm never going to turn my back on that. I'm like, I'm how can I reinvent the old? That's what I did when I did the month record. I was trying. It, it, that only reason why that record came about is because a guy told me, a kid, a student told me, he was like, "Monk is old. <laughs> We're beyond that. You know, we don't we, we don't play that way anymore." And I was like, "Oh, okay." So I came and I did these hard arrangements, and then I asked the kid years later to sit in. He was like, "No, nah. uh, he didn't want to sit in because." I was like, but you told me, remember when we were at Banff, you said that Monk was easy and like it was old. And I said, like, this is Monk. He's like, well, not like that. You know, so I think us going to going back and, and revisiting the, the old stuff and trying to make the old stuff new. Right. I, I, there's something to be said in like playing just like Philly Joe or, or Max or something. Like, yes. But like, I don't think Max or Philly Joe or Elvin, they would want us to be trying to sound like them only. They want to yeah. hear but within that jazz umbrella, because you have to be careful because that jazz umbrella, you can go just a little. And to me, now you're in fusion. You know what I'm saying? And then they want to confuse the fusion with the jazz. And it's not that, you know, there's a certain, you know, feeling with jazz. Yeah, th this is really vibing with me. I, I think I think like people who came up in New York during a certain time, like late 90s, early 2000s, probably share this, this broad idea of it. Because I've been interested from, from some of the younger people of what they mean when they use the word jazz. And, and it's not what it meant to me when I was coming up. Like, I defined jazz as, can you hang at Smalls? Right. Like, can, can you go down and, and, and sit in and somebody calls stable mates? Can, can you sound interesting over that? And can you take a, can you trade over that form? Um, and, and I think, you know, the definition's just gotten broader, but I'm also really resonating with what, what you're saying about it's, ah, and I'm, I'm always, I'm always worried about getting myself in trouble, but, there are some very good players who play jazz, jazz the way you and I think of it, like it's repertory music, where they're, they're, they're trying to sound like Kenny Clark and they're satisfied with that. And that's cool. Like that's one thing. And then there's, there's another crowd who are not trying to, trying to play any of the traditional stuff at all. It, maybe they're inspired by it and, and maybe they consider things like bitches brew and um, the fusion era as part of the canon. And that's valid too. But, but I think what you're talking about and the thing we saw roughly, let's say 94 through maybe 2014 um, was those two things being Venn diagrammed where, it, where it's like you had people deeply steep within the tradition, but also doing like, wildly creative things like you Hutch and blade, Eric Harland, um, Nashit, um, Elu, Eric Lewis, um, Mark, Marcus Gilmore, um, Ari Honig, Bill Stewart. Um, it, it felt like it just felt like a sweet spot, like with, within the constraints of the, of the, the idiom, like there was just all this, this creative, energy and spark happening. And I'm, I'm hesitant to make a value judgment about that because one of the, one of the cool things about it, it seems to me is that it kind of happened organically. Like it was this sort of serendipity of, of the avatar Winton plus, plus places people could get mentorship, like Betty Carter's band plus music school plus audiences that just kept that, that flywheel going. And, I'm sure you probably see this teaching, but it seems like the music schools to a big degree are keeping that flywheel alive. It's just a matter of like there being another avatar they want to emulate and then probably the audience for it as well. Yeah. I, I mean, the schools have to continue to feed the appetite of where young people are, right? That's... Uh, that's a given, right? Um, I think when you, all those names that you mentioned, I think early on, 
I don't know for certain, but I would think that early on they they were interested in taking the tradition and building on that tradition while still keeping the tradition. What it, what happens is now it's like people had they 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 see the tradition or they spend a, a two seconds in the tradition, then want to abandon it completely and just be over here, right? And then I think we then and if that's the case, then we should have a new category that we what we call that, you know. Um, when you listen to Papa Joe Jones, Max, Elvin, there's a succession. There's a there's a line of vocabulary that came, and you can see even when Elvin changed it and opened it up, it's still you can tell where he was, what he got from Philly Joe Jones. You know what I'm saying? Like so that that line was still there, and you can go and trace. And that's I want to be that type of drummer where you can go and still trace. Um, what I, where I'm playing, and I I can I can really almost every lick that I play, I can tell you exactly. I can go back and and, and tell you where I got it from and how I changed it. Right? It's like you know, early on, it was like, yeah, I think I just had the 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 mind to be like, you know, how can I change this? You know, I play it, and immediately I'm like, okay, great. What can I do? What else can I do with it? And and how can I use this immediately? You know. Um, I mean, it's beautiful to be able to try to play like, you know, um, like the older guys, but at the end of the day, I, that voice in my head studying with Alan Dawson, like they, I don't think they want it <laughs> to see us play like them, but they want us, they, they, but they, but we have to train, right? We have to train and we have to learn this language. You have to learn the vocabulary. It's like, what you, what can you do with that vocabulary? But still, that's why jazz is hard. Like trying to figure out what to do with vocabulary and play it over a tune and make it all work. Like people look at jazz now, it's just like, oh, it's just because I want to show you all the stuff that I can do. That has no, that has no, 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 no line where it really comes from, you know. Um, but I, I tell people all the time, and uh, that when you listen to, I have my students doing Jordu and um, Joy Spring from the Clifford Brown Max Roach record. I mean, you hear, we go back and we listen. Oh, Clifford Brown played the same thing that Max started off his solo, right? And they don't even know that. And we, we listen to that. And then we say, okay, like all of these ideas that Max has, I can show you what well, we play that. And then I'll show them. I'll say like the way that my brain works and I want your brain to work this way is like you take that one idea and now let's put that idea in seven or let's put this idea, let's reorchestrate it. Let's put it in a groove. Max played it on the, on the drums this way, but let's put it on a hi-hat. You know, so we're still playing the same vocabulary. So you're not yeah. changing the vocabulary. If you're changing, you're just basically changing the or orchestration and perception of where the lick is going or coming from. This, this is a great thread. And I'm glad you brought up Alan Dawson because literally earlier today, I was having a discussion with a student about Alan. And of course, every, everyone knows him for the rudimental ritual. But and I think this will be a jumping off place to go deeper into, into how you teach improvisation. Because the, the thing I've been reckon, reckoning with, both in my own playing and with my students, is there's where the material ends. There's the rudimental ritual. There's Ted Reed syncopation. I see you have on the, the stand behind you. There's, there's Jim Chapin. There's, there's Tony Cerrone. There, there's the repertoire. And then there's jumping off a cliff and taking a solo. And what's, what are the intermediate steps? And, and I'm, I'm starting to answer that for me. There's like taking two licks and combining them in different ways or orchestrating them. Or there's like trading fours with yourself. Like you play, play four of max and then you you answer that but 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 i'm curious like if you have any tricks of the trade or any things that pop out to you that that have been especially helpful for you and your students in terms of bridging that gap between the material and actually improvising with it it's kind of like what you said but in every lesson i tell the kids it's not just going to stay on this piece of paper you know that right and they say yeah no i know i say no it's really not going to stay here I'm never going to give you busy work <laughs> and I'm always going to give you something that is going somewhere else. And they didn't get that for like five or six weeks, but now 14, 15 weeks in now they'll come in with, and we only can talk. We'll, we'll take like, we'll take the first two measures of rolling rhythm 
and they play that and, and maybe they play the whole solo great, but they don't know what to do with it. So it's like, what do we do with that? How can we use that? So we take rolling rhythm. We take the first two, those third, first two measures, which is basically a measure of four. Then we boot that up against a Max Roach thing, right? Mm -hmm. Then that we play that Max Roach idea. But then also we, we looked at Max Roach and we figured out how can we modernize it? So now we have the Wilcoxon idea. We have the Max original idea and then boot it up against the idea that you change of Max. Now, to me, we're starting to, to get into a zone. Like I would take, we'll take a, um, any phrase that any drummer played, let's say we're talking about Max right now, but we'll take a, a, a you know, one bar, two bar idea. How many ways can we change that one or two bar idea? Like literally, like we can, we can do a lot, like a lot, a lot of people. And I need you to be, and I need my students to be thinking out of the box, right? Because when I say we can do a lot, that means they think that, oh, it's just going to, it's ba basically two bars of two, four. We stay in that two, four. No, but what are the smaller phrases in that there's two fours now we got a bar five or we got a seven beat phrase now we got a nine beat we got a 13 beat all of that to me is wilcoxon we not we didn't leave wilcoxon we're still on wilcoxon so we're still trying to figure out you know how to tie it and to me that's how you really build vocabulary that's tying in with the old vocabulary i don't know if that answers your question but that's the way that's the way i see it you know that's like right. you're saying trading with yourself right Basically, that's question and answer. You, we, we, you know. So, the, how often do we talk about question and answer with that with our with our students? You know, I learned from a classical guy a long time ago. It's the question that involves the listener. That question, that first thing that you play, is the thing that's going to make me say, "Oh, is there more?" So you need to be playing from from that perspective. And that from play, meaning playing from that perspective means that. You don't have to play a thousand notes. You just have to play something meaningful in that first setting, you know, and you do that. You got my intention. Now I'm listening. What are you going to do next? Then, you know, it's read, man, that book. I, I, I feel guilty because I use it so much. It's a great book, but I don't use it just the way everybody else uses. It. It's like make our own exercises from the read. There's all kinds of five, four bars and seven, eight bars and 13 beat phrases and all of that in read. We don't have to go anywhere. And if we know read from the beginning with the with the regular ways of doing it, okay, that's vocabulary and that's fitting in the tradition. So we still play that, even though we're playing five, seven, 13 or whatever, but we play it with that, with that mindset. We're still playing the tradition. So, you know, I'm definitely coming from putting stuff together to come up with your own vocabulary, you know? Or say if we, so like, look, say if we have a Philly Joe Jones solo, right? Four bars. Maybe this is simple. You probably do this already, but you play the shit out of the four bars. Like, yeah, I got it. It's like, okay, what else can we do with it? Oh, we can we can reorchestrate. Okay, yeah, that's great. What else can we do with it? Um, I don't know. What else can we do with it? We have it written down now, and I've been preaching this for years. That same four bar phrase that Philly Joe did, we take the fourth bar and we start, that's the first bar. And then we, you know, so we're chunkifying it, as you would say, we're moving things around. And then that gets to me, then you're speaking the same language. People will say, huh, I understand the words that he's saying or that she's saying, but she or he is not saying exactly like Philly Joe. It's just, it's reminiscent of Philly Joe because you've taken those words and put them around, moved them around and made your own sentence. I think that's valid. Once I start thinking, when I start teaching from that aspect, the students love that because now they don't, but like, it's the worst thing. If you, you go to a, a jam session and you play somebody's solo verbatim, okay, there's some novelty in that, but like, really, is that, you know, that's what you want to do? You're sitting there and playing stable mates and you're going to play exactly what Max or Philly or Jimmy Cobb played on that? No, you want to have it played that like, man, that sounds like vocabulary. Right. Yeah. Or or you quote it, you know, th th throw in a little quote here or there. Yeah. Yeah, you can. But if you throw. OK, so say if you throw in that quote. Right. Which is great. The, the, the slick thing would be to throw in that quote and then displace that quote or throw in that quote and then make that quote into a, a, another angular type of phrase. Like do something like Bill Stewart. What he does is when he plays an idea. He slaps you every which way. You're like this. Well, okay. Well, it, and it's amazing. Every kind of way you can think about playing this phrase within a certain realm, he's playing it. 
that's I mean, we all have that thinking ability. You know, we get the, we, we you you see all these guys playing stuff on YouTube or whatever, man. Like, all right, take that idea and and just stay with that idea for two or three months instead of like oh, a day or two. Like, really explore, push yourself. When you think about it, Philly Joe himself kind of sounded the way he did because he probably went through a process like that as well. Like his his stuff sounds messed with and and angularized, at least relative to to his time. And yeah, I'm not sure where to go with that, but I, I suppose it's just an argument for yeah, don't, anything you learn if you want to be an original, um, don't just leave it there. Don't leave. Yeah. You know, Philly Joe, you know, I, I know for a fact you can hear it in his playing that he would play Wilcoxon because everybody knows he played Wilcoxon. But like he would take it. And Philly Joe, there's an interview out there now. Philly Joe said he never played. He never practiced for more than an hour. He said he would play and he would take a break and walk. But like you can tell that he would play something and then you can hear him put it in a musical context on the drum set. But he's not playing that whole phrase. He's just breaking up parts of it. And he's stitching all these parts together. And I and when I hear his playing, I hear a lot of stitching. A lot of but stitching is hard. Stitching means you have to go to practice room and figure out how to how to sew. Yeah, stitching stitching is the skill, isn't it? Like yeah. it's not adjunct. It's the it's the thing <laughs> to, to creating your own voice. There are so many directions I want to go. Uh, but I I also want to ask you about time because that's that's something that's sort of like the hidden leveler. And I, I remember being out of music school and playing the jam session at Cleopatra's Needle and afterwards having the bass player say to me, like, why are you going to rush like that? And yeah, I want to ask you about time from two two perspectives. And to, to take us back to some of the recordings you were on that, that were a huge influence. Like one thing that I heard you do, which is way more in vogue now, by the way, but, but I heard you doing like early 2000s was deliberately dragging while keeping the original pulse in your head or like deliberately rushing while keeping the original pulse in, in your head. And like at the time, it's like, whoa, what's happening? And, and now that's, that's become more of a hip thing. But use with caution, kids, because you need to have very, very good time in order to do that. You have so, to plan the right cats to be able to do it and pull up. Go ahead. This is true, too. So, so, so I'm curious where that came from for you. Like, w did you always just take for granted you had great time or did you have to work at it? And like, how do you help your students develop that? No, I still work on on time. I mean, you know, um, I listen to too much Tony at one time because we, you know, he brushes or you know, people yeah, um plays Willie on top of the beat. Betty demanded everybody played on top of the beat in her band. You know, there's a certain excitement and that's it's just been burned into my DNA. Um but I look at time as a lot of people think of time is like it's here like when they're playing. And you know, I don't I've never really thought of time as, as being there or or here. Like the time, the grounding is here and my butt, my my torso, this is where the time is. And now I should be able to teeter on either either side of that, you know? And I know I, I've spent time practicing, you know, um, I thought I heard Steve Gadd say he would mess around with the time, but like, you know, like when you go in the studio and you're with the metronome, the met metronome disappears or the, the click track disappears and you that's when you know you're really on. But I would practice with the DAWs and knowing that the time is here and I would just try to, you know, go in and out of the time and into, you know, until it felt comfortable and be able to like live. If I'm dragging, be able to play ideas over there and then come back. You know, you want to think of time like it's, it's like this, this rubber band or something like that. I think it's, it's fun for me. It's more like, you know, it's like, yeah, it's like games, but you have to be able to play with the right cats. I know I've been, I've done that and I've told the bass player, don't, you can't go with me. Just like you, once you hear it, once you have the time, don't leave it, you know, and then I'll be able to, to yeah, I want to be able to, 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 to weave in and out. But um, I learned, man, years ago from you, I think you were one of the first people I heard doing this with the, 
this place metronome as much as you used to do it. Like, you know, like changing the perspective. And man, years ago, I was like, man, that's pretty deep. And I definitely, I teach that to all my kids now. Like I, none of my, none of my students um, practice with the metronome on, on the beat. Like every, because my, in my opinion is that we've been, well, we lean on the metronome if it's on the beat, if it's on two or four, if it's on one and three, we're not, pra- we're not playing with the time. That is our time. Right. But if you move that metronome to the second triplet or the third triplet or the third partial of a quintuplet or the fourth partial or the fifth partial of a quintuplet, then now you are really honing in your time. And it's supposed to be hard. <laughs> it doesn't supposed to be good. It's going to be hard until it gets in your DNA, you know. But if you think about us always having that grounding or playing from that perspective, our grounding has to be there, right? In order to play with the metronome shifted in these partials, these different partials, your center has to be there. And then that's where you, then you're always playing from your center as opposed to letting the metronome be, be the thing that, 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 that's holding you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And, and the, the way I conceive it is if you're playing with the metronome on the on the beat, you're you're fo- you're essentially following it. So you're not teaching yourself to create the time. But, but if you have it in other record. places, then you have to make a guess about where the pulse is, and the metronome will show you if you're correct or incorrect. Um, that's super flattering, by the way. If it, that you saw my stuff, like I'm 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 very flattered about that. But it all came from, you know, like that story I told you about the needle, where like. I realized maybe early 20 teens that the time among my many obstacles, time was like looming the largest. Like I would, I would listen back to myself on recordings and just, it was missing that, that upbeat downbeat tension that really make makes like a good players playing like snap. It just, it was loose in all the wrong places and rushing in all the wrong places. So it's, it's been like a 15 year battle to try to, try to wrestle my time into submission and it's it goes on every day but who gave you that idea though to you know i mean yeah yeah where did you get that idea from i don't remember i I guarantee somebody did it before me and i stole it from them yeah yeah (laughs) i wish i I could remember so i could give them credit (laughs) no it's a it's a look i think there should be a class on really in, inventive ways or creative ways of practicing with a click or with a metronome. I was doing a, a clinic in Europe the uh, you know uh, earlier, and I was playing with a guy named Hans Glavishnik, bass player. Mm. And um, I had my thing of shifting the metronome. He was like, yeah, but what I do is the metronome. Now, that's beat four. Now, I'm going to play four bars and land back on that beat four or that's beat four, and it, and it didn't, wouldn't move. He said, now that's beat four, now I'm gonna play two bars. You know, and I'm just like, you know, it, but all that space is like, you really have to have a, a center to be able to do that. And I was really impressed with that. That's, you know, but it takes going into the practice room and having, developing a relationship with the metronome. A lot of us don't have a relationship with time, right? If you are leaning on time, whether if it's on two or four or one and three, you're leaning. That's not a relationship with time. But if you if you can center yourself and that metronome is that partial every time and you can start to solo, that is to me, you develop a relationship with time. Amazing. Well, it's it's been um, super awesome talking. Like, obviously, I've followed you for years. I think we've emailed back and forth, but I don't know if we've ever had a chance no. to, to chat. Yeah. So this has been great. So really, really appreciate your time. Where would you send people to check out the latest stuff you've got going on? My I, my my original ideas, or I like to which put a uh, little snippets up, is my Instagram channel, which is Clarence Pin, I think. <laughs> yeah, and um, uh, and that's probably the most the place that I'm most active. That and Facebook. Um, but I am on faculty full time here at USC. So um, if you are interested in coming, I'd love to have you. You know the students, um, and um, yeah, I'm just trying to stay out there, man. So that's it, you know. And but Nate, I have to say, man, I want to just tell you, man, you, what you're doing is, is is good. I I really appreciate it. you've been at it for a while and unwavering. Just 
I, man, to my work ethic, you are committed to this. And I appreciate that. You have not given up and you always come with ideas. You know, some of the ideas may be a little <laughs> on the other side, but like, you know, you are engaging. So my problem is like, I don't have a problem. I love it when 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 people just open it up for dialogue, right? We need more of just posing questions and talking about stuff. You talk about people's setup, you talk about symbol, you talk about time, you talk about the car parking and the thing of, you know, we, you know, you took all of that stuff. We need as many ways to think about what we do as possible. Right? Well, you're 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 too kind. <laughs> and uh <laughs> one one of these days I'm gonna get it right too. <laughs> I keep chipping away. <laughs> We're getting there, baby stuff. You know, hey, hey man. Hopefully, I, I'll, I'll, hopefully, I can get it right too. But like, I don't, I don't even think it's a. Just continue to follow your 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 north star because you are you're doing it, man. And you know, and the companies are paying attention, and and just keep doing it, man. Just keep us thinking. Well, I really appreciate it. Anyway, this has been an honor. It's been great to catch up finally. Um, and yeah, hope hope we keep in touch. But but uh, really, really awesome chatting with you. Definitely, Nate. Good luck with everything, man. Peace. You too, man. Take care.